Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to Sniper Elite 4. Today we'll be taking a look at why Regilino Viaduct is such an excellent level. But before we begin, let's take a look at why my Discord server is such an excellent platform to hang out with people who like Sniper Elite. No, but seriously, I'm going to start hosting game nights and stuff on there. So if you want to be part of that, then come along. So without further ado, let's get into this. Regilino Viaduct is the third mission in Sniper Elite 4, and the first mission to really start to treat you like a grown-up. Sansolini and Bitanti Village have done an excellent job at making you accustomed to the way the game is played, and now you're out in the big wide world of proper sniping. The level introduces Jaeger troops, who add some variety to the standard combat experience. The first proper use of the sniper, who, although in Batanti Village, was about as useful as Stephen Hawking once he's had his tyres slashed. We also get introduced to Spotters, who are the most annoying little Nazis you've ever seen. Gotten Himmel, look at my flare gun and how big and manly I am. Darling Helga would be proud of me dropping seven tons of high explosive onto a single allied commando, because that's the honourable way to fight someone one on one. Also, we get introduced to armoured cars and half-tracks in this mission, and of course, the means of blowing them up. You did well to find me at the castle. So it was a test, to see if I'm uh, committed to your cause. The pre-level section starts in a small secluded area atop a cliff facing the viaduct. The viaduct has recently been home to some near indestructible German railway gun, it has killed many partisans, and if it's not dealt with, it'll soon kill many allied soldiers as they advance up from the south of Italy. If you ask me, using a railway gun that fires shells that are 31 inches in diameter onto civilian fighters armed solely with patriotism and blind hope seems a bit dishonourable, but I don't really think that one ball Adolf really cared about honour. Allied intelligence wants this railway gun dealt with, and sees it as a good opportunity to win the trust of Sophia Di Rocco, who thinks it's a good challenge to see if Carl Fairburn is really on her side or not. So, Carl sets off. The level begins a little way down the cliff face on a small plateau area. This is a good opportunity to tag some of the people on the viaduct, or if you have a Mosin again, shoot some of the people on the viaduct. And this is the first section of what makes this level so brilliant. Despite being a game built around sniping, Sniper Elite 4 does not have an incredibly long average engagement range. For most levels, you'll only really be shooting people who are around 100 metres away or less, but the design of this level really allows you to get some extreme range kills in there. It's basically a valley with a spawn at one end and the viaduct at the other. The sightlines from this plateau allow the player to shoot all the way from one end to the other of the map, which is a good 550 metres away. This is the only real time that range like this happens and it is brilliant fun. Climbing down the plateau, the player is faced with three paths. Heading to the left takes you to the first checkpoint. This is a very well designed area with good verticality and excellent sightlines and these qualities create a fair yet challenging battle for a surprisingly well defended first checkpoint. Heading forward from here takes you to the second checkpoint concealed in the tree line. This is a very good stealth area and very rewarding. Trying to approach this checkpoint from the road is suicide, as a panther term sits near the checkpoint waiting to turn you into Swiss cheese if you poke your head around from the trees. Silent but violent is the motto for this section, and you soon should have eradicated everybody from the checkpoint, leaving it lonelier than a nun's undergarments. Moving down the valley, we come across the transport depot, perfect for a short range and highly explosive skirmish. About here is where you'll probably come across the armoured car. It's a 222, not an AB41, so that makes it a little easier. Some anti-vehicle ordnance should be found near the transport depot, a telemine should do the trick, but if you're compensating for something, then you'll want to put some TNT down as well. Remember, size matters, so the bigger the explosion, the better. Next up, you'll come across the ammunition bunker and the associated sprawl of buildings. 
This is a very complex and intense firefight, with a sniper in the watchtower and a platoon of troops with an itchy trigger finger. A wise man once said that golf is a good walk ruined, but that's not important right now. What is important is that an even wiser man once said that dead Nazis are the best sort of Nazis, and fueled with this inspirational quote, you should kill these guys with no trouble. I feel this area gets dangerously close to suffering from Death Storm 1 syndrome, which is where there's too much going on at once, but because this is just a little area and not the whole level, it gets away with it, although I do think it is the weakest part of this level. Now we move on to the main attraction, the Viaduct, and it is huge. It is about the size of an average American with almost twice the intelligence and the viaduct is an excellent fight. Ridiculously long sight lines and thanks to the scaffolding, a surprisingly large amount of variety awaits. The scaffolding is what really makes this part of the level and contributes a lot to the fast paced action of this section, providing you didn't wipe out the forces here from your spawn point. If you did, then the sudden arrival of a half track full of troops should put you in your place. Now, remember when 466 words ago I said there were three paths to take at the beginning? Let's talk briefly about the middle one. This is the first time you will have come across a minefield, and after getting through that, you'll be well on your way to the small village in the middle of the level. If you went right, you'll come across a sawmill, and this is one of the greatest set pieces in the game. The trees and log piles should give you decent cover, and now it is a veritable bloodbath, a bit like my 7th birthday, except with Nazis involved. Moving forward, you'll arrive at the crash reconnaissance plane. This plane is heavily guarded, and the bad guys have much better cover than you, providing you come in from in front. I am a clever boy, so I came in from behind Giggity. This is a bit of a tricky section though, uh, all jokes aside. At the far end of the plane crash area, you can find a secret passage that takes you to the signal house near the viaduct which is actually a good way of getting in, especially seeing as this will take you out behind the half track. Alternatively, following the road down will take you to the village, which is the only real urban area in the mission. This is a very fun section and it's set up well for stealth if you're intelligent, or close quarters firefights if you aren't. And that's all I actually have to say about the level itself, but now it's time for some soppy rubbish about how excellent design works well together to create an excellent level. The first and most obvious part of this level's brilliance is, of course, the gigantinormous sightlines. This is the most obvious in the huge sightline down the valley of the viaduct, which is the wet dream of every Mosin Nagant main and the absolute worst part of the level for anyone who packed an M1 carbine. But it's also shown in several other places around the level, and these are easy to miss if you aren't thinking about them, especially seeing as they are overshadowed by the sightline at the beginning. Around the far end of the level, stretching from the signal house at the bottom end of the viaduct, all the way around to the road curling upside the hillside above the village, there is an excellent set of sightlines where, depending on where you are, you can shoot troops on the viaduct in the valley and in the village. This incredible verticality and distance just aren't seen in other franchises, Games like Halo and Battlefield will have levels with huge wide open spaces which are perhaps even bigger than this one here, but in the case of Halo, these are just used as vehicle rampage sections, and in the case of Battlefield, these are just used as ways to make the maps seem expansive when in fact they're little more than a barren cruise in a battered Kubelwagen on your way to a very compact and very constricted set piece where the real fighting happens. Whilst expansive, Regilino Viaduct is alive and bustling, and there's something going on wherever you go, and they make it seem realistic too. Traditionally, when designing a big area, game designers will go one of two ways. They'll either make it completely featureless, like the desert in GTA San Andreas. Whilst realistic, whilst deserts are like this, making the environment less interesting than Black Ops 3's storyline makes it thoroughly boring to drive through. Then we have the World's Edge map from Apex. This is the exact opposite. Everywhere is a point of interest and it just isn't realistic. It doesn't work because everything is piled on top of everything else. Here I have highlighted in red every single point of interest in World's Edge. Now I have highlighted the places where people actually go. Do you see the issue? 
Death Storm 1 has the same problem, everything is next to everything else, all trying to outdo the next thing along in a desperate bid to grab your attention. Regilino Viaduct manages to get away from this. Whilst the map is full of stuff, it seems realistic as everywhere has something clearly going on yet it is well divided by sections where nothing is really happening. And for the most part, these empty sections are excellent sniper spots with good sight lines and vantage points and that is just brilliant games design. A sniper's nest doesn't need several buildings, a tank and an elaborate environmental set piece. The place you're shooting at does. And this is what this level masters. Here I have highlighted all the points of interest in Regilino in red and all of the sniper spots in yellow and it shows how well this level is designed. There are clear divisions between the points of interest and more often than not all of those gaps are home to power positions or sniper spots for the player and as I said that's just brilliant game design and there's no denying that and it's something that games just don't do anymore. But let's not forget about the other thing that makes Regilino excellent, the atmosphere. The level is set in the daytime, providing perfect visibility to complement the long range shots you'll be pulling off. The forest is lush and peaceful, full of plants and trees. The stream that runs down the valley is a nice touch, and even nicer is the fact that you can actually walk down it. The water in the bay at the top left of the map is perfectly still, and it's also tranquil and beautiful and yet the shadow of the Nazi war machine looms over the valley in the shape of a railway gun, which is bigger than Richard Osman and almost as loud as Brian Blessed, and the huge roar of the shell being fired at innocent civilians penetrates the tranquility like a Kakano round penetrating Nazi balls, and who can forget the spectacular ending, the viaduct being completely and utterly destroyed, crushed harder than Prince Andrew's hopes of ruling the country. And so that's about it from me. What do you think about Regilino Viaduct? How do you think it holds up compared to other levels? And I'd love to hear your thoughts below. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you everyone for watching the video. Remember to like, subscribe and comment. It costs you nothing and it's a great way to help out the channel. Stay safe and goodbye.